And welcome everybody. We are live. So excited to have you here. Uh, this is my first time live on StreamYard. So thank you to Melissa Jakes from Rescue Event Planning for making this possible. I am Jen Dalton. I'm a personal brand strategist for entrepreneurs and executives. Thrilled to have you here to talk about my latest book, my second book, so thank you for joining me live. I really appreciate it. You can drop questions in the chat and we'll pop them in over to the live conversation. One of the things I am most excited about to kick off this author series over this week and next week is that with me, I have Professor Danielle Robinson Bell. Not only is she assistant professor at Northwestern University, um, she's also a friend of mine from high school. So welcome to Danielle. I would love her to give you a little bit of background about herself and introduce uh, what makes her so amazing. <laughs> oh, Jen, thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, we do go way back. <laughs> uh, <Not far> back. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I, I was honored to, to have this time with you uh, this, this evening on such an occasion. So congratulations on, on this uh, momentous um, um, occasion, the release of your second book. Um, so I'm glad to be here. As you mentioned, I'm a professor at Northwestern University. I teach strategic communications. I think and talk and teach a lot <laughs> about the impact of communications on things that matter. And in my world, that's the in the business world, that's business outcomes. Um, but in uh, as it relates to what we're going to be talking about here tonight and and in our you know our personal lives, you know, that also things that matter, um, you know, personal relationships uh, as well. So um, so it's a little bit about me and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I um this is a meaningful book. It's a personal book. Um, and so I couldn't think of anybody better to interview. Thank you. Thank you. I, yeah, I was going to say, I'm just going to jump right in. I was going to say, in, ask me some hard questions. <laughs> so I can't think of a more important time in our lives, in our country, for a book like this. So I wanted to start off by hearing your why behind this book? What inspired you to write this book at this time? That is a great question. Uh, it's been a few years in the making, so it's a bit fortuitous that um, it's all coming together in such a pivotal year. Uh, but a few years ago in the 2018 elections, because, you know, all things politics at the moment, uh, but at the time, I remember I was sitting on the couch in a moment of Zen and peace, which is not often in my life. I have two kids, a dog, business. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was reading a book with a cup of coffee and my husband, who is Republican, I'm Democrat, but we see things very similarly. He said something, I don't even remember what he said, but I remember just having this visceral reaction where I wanted to leap over the wall. And we have a knee wall, so I'm sure so it, it's possible it could have happened. Um, and be like, what are you talking about? Um, but I remember because I had such a visceral reaction, I was like, why am I overreacting like this? Um, especially with someone that I know, like and trust, we've been together for 20 years. It's like, he's not gonna hurt me. What's going on here? And so I started doing research into why do we overreact? What does that look like? Um, and I put together a talk and a presentation and did research. And then in 2019, my mother passed away and that kicked off a whole nother series of conversations about grief, conversations with my father, with friends who had gone through it. And so that is really what triggered me deciding to write a book and saying, gosh, I know, you know, I think I'm good at communications. But this is a whole nother level of communications that we really don't face every day, but we will face them throughout life. And so I started to think about, you know, who do I know that's really good at communicating and then interviewing them. Uh, and that's really how the book came together is through interviews and just trying to pull together a, a new perspective of how to look at having difficult conversations. So, and I think it's, it's interesting that, um, it's, it seems to be just, it was the perfect mix of 
timing in terms of all the things that were going on around us and in your um, in your personal your lot uh, in your personal life. I know that one of the last times that you and I. Um, uh, we're in a forum like this together, uh, was just over the summer. And it was um, at the um, re re reunion, high school reunion. <laughs> we'll say what number. Year reunion. Some, some number. Good year. Some good number. <laughs> of, um, a reunion with our high school classmates. And um, we after we got through the hellos and introductions and catching up and things of that nature, um, a very powerful conversation, a very powerful, I don't even have the word for it. Maybe, maybe you need to be in communications. I don't have the word for that. Something very powerful unfolded at that event. And it was in a form like this. It was on Zoom. And I think What's important to note about that was um, that it, the date. So we had this online virtual high school reunion on June 6th of this year. And if you recall, June 6th puts us at about a week, maybe a little more than a week after the murder of George Floyd. And I, mean, I don't want to do all the talking here. I'll let you take over. But um, if, for, for context, you and I went to high school in Augusta, Georgia at a very unique, know, diverse, unique <laughs> diverse, by their definition, school, um, school of the fine arts. And um, it was just really powerful to hear while catching up on everyone's lives how everyone was processing um, not just the events of this year, the of, at that time of that past week, but then drawing connections and drawing links to experiences that we shared in the hallways, in the classrooms uh, you know, back in the day. Absolutely. And I was surprised at some of what people shared because I hadn't ever heard these stories. And so it was fascinating. Um, first of all, it was fascinating that we, as a group, collectively decided, let's talk about race. Let's talk about what did people face? What were different situations? What were things they face now that was different when they were in high school? Um, worse now, they had better experiences in high school. I mean, it was, it was not what I expected at all. Um, but I was, first I was scared. I was like, oh my gosh, we're really going to talk about this. But then I was like, well, we need to talk about it. And, you know, our class was small, it was 72 people. We had 35 people at our reunion. Um, and so we really had a great discussion just sharing. And when I think about the types of conversations we have, when we go into them, sometimes it is really just to learn and to listen. And that is the, the best place to start a conversation is just to listen. I think we go into conversations sometimes thinking the goal is to either win or solve the world's problems. And that's not how most hard conversations work. They occur over time. And they occur because you you listen and hear what people have gone through. I mean, that's what helped me get through um, the initial part of my mom passing. I'm still going through that. But I think for conversations like race, um, you know, for, for people who are coming out, you know, any of these topics in the book that I, I share, unless you hear someone's perspective, their truth, um, it's very hard to know what that is unless you ask. Yeah. And so I was very proud of us at that reunion. Granted, we did have a couple of drinks, I think. We spent about four hours on a Zoom call. So we're a close class, right. um, but we shared a lot. And I think that's important. I think people forget that the reason we should talk about hard topics mm -hmm. is so we don't feel so alone. Right. And that helps you process your emotions and just have more information. Right. So it's actually a really good, a good thing to do is to have these difficult conversations, even though we've been trained, don't talk about politics, don't talk about religion. We right. need to, that's a muscle we need to build. And so what struck me um, to your point about the book is that it feels so relatable. I, I mean, it's engaging. The pages turn very easily. 
<laughs> and <laughs> and you're you're left with these very practical takeaways. And it's it's rare, at least I found it rare, that those two dynamics exist in one text. So how did <laughs> how did you do that? <laughs> how did you make this book such a such an engaging read, but such an impactful takeaway? Well, I'm glad you found it engaging. Um, I'm a big believer in storytelling. And so, you know, when we communicate and we share a lot of numbers and data, that really only engages one part of your brain. Uh, but when we tell stories, that engages your entire brain. And so the beauty of this process, you know, I'm not a research expert in communications, right? I haven't I mean, there are plenty of people who've written books, difficult conversations, crucial conversations, impossible conversations. There's a lot of books out there, right? And um, my goal was really just to step back as a, as a mere mortal and write about, here's what it feels like going through a conversation, but, but share the full story. Because sometimes we need context about, well, why did this conversation start? what happened during it, not just a few sentences, but like the whole experience. And so interviewing people who were so generous in sharing these private personal stories so that, you know, if you do have a child who comes out as transgender, I have an interview about that, right? In, in a chapter that's about coming out. Um, if you do want to talk politics, the chapter I have on politics is an interview between a father and daughter. And so all of these stories, I wanted people to read them and, and almost like you were sitting on my shoulder listening to this interview, almost like you were in the conversation. Because a lot of times we don't get that full story and that's really what matters. Um, and I'm a big fan of takeaways. So I don't give a talk or go to a meeting without here some takeaways. What are we gonna do next? Mm -hmm. So I tried to pull together insightful, quick, easy to remember things um, that people can think about because we are not wired for difficult conversations. We're wired really honestly to avoid them, right? We're wired to survive and difficult conversations tend to really create stress. So we avoid them. So what are some of those tips and tricks that I learned that other people learned and shared? Um, and so I think, you know, at the end of the book, I've got the final chapter sort of pulls out sort of my top five takeaways and then a framework for how to think about communicating, hopefully in a way that helps people just get through a conversation in a way that does not damage a relationship. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we have some of those easy things we can do. They're only easy if you know them that easy things we can do um, to keep moving the conversation forward, but right. not hurt the relationship. So, so let's stick with the frameworks for a second. Um, Cause one of the things you do in the book that I love is that you, like we gotta talk about give, give these very interesting interviews. And I wanna come back to the interviews for just a second after this question, but that you, um, and you, you don't just leave it you just leave us with these wonderful stories, right? You go a step further and give us ways to identify and navigate similar types of conversations in our own lives, right? Um, the frame, like, so talk to me a little bit about the framework because it feels very um, in a space of its own um, as it relates to other, other texts that are out there. So for me, and I'm, I'm a very structured person, I like having a structure because when I have a structure, it helps me depersonalize and just step back and navigate something easily. It's like going to a restaurant. You need to have a menu. It just makes it easier. Unless it's like the Cheesecake Factory, which has the menu with a thousand things. Um, <laughs> but they're good, but it's a lot. Um, so the framework is, is six pieces, which sounds like a lot, but I think as I talk through it, it'll make more sense. Um, I think a conversation can have different elements. There's a conversation where you go in and you're listening. There's a conversation type where you go in to share information. There's a conversation where you go in to collaborate. And those are all really positive. You're listening, you're sharing, you're collaborating. 
There are three others that are a little bit trickier. One is a provocative conversation. Uh, we all have those where someone throws a verbal grenade and you're just sort of hoping for the best. Um, there's a conversation where you change someone's mind or you wanna change their behavior. And so as I looked through all of these conversations and tried to think about what are those different themes, those are the six that stood out. Listen, share, collaborate, a provocative conversation, uh, changing someone's mind, changing their behavior. And as I started to look at those themes, the reality is in a given conversation, you can be in one, two, three, or even all six of those, right? A conversation can go through different stages. And for me, if I'm in a conversation and it starts out provocative, because that can happen, my goal is to get it back to maybe just listening, right? Maybe that is a success. Someone comes to me with something provocative, maybe they're sad, mad, upset, whatever it is. And my goal is to help de-escalate to listen. Maybe there's not anything for me to share. Maybe they just want to vent. Um, maybe I ask, can I help you? Are you just venting? Do you want some thoughts? And then they might say, yeah, actually, what do you think? And then it's like listening in a sharing conversation. So the goal with these different types of conversations was really to help think about where am I? Can I de-escalate? So it's kind of like a little roadmap or guide to help you figure out, hey, what is this? Okay, this is where we are. Let's think about these different tools. Um, and so that's why I came up with those six. And I'm hoping it is different uh, after looking at all the frameworks that it's different enough that it's valuable. Um, everybody will find value or like different things. And as long as this framework helps people and gives them one more tool to think about, then that's a win. Well, I think it's also not just about having something to think about, but calling it something. Yes. Right. Naming, so, it. naming it. Right. And the important, I think that's, um, in, in a lot of different contexts, wildly important um, when you can name something, it, it helps sort of break open <laughs> then how to navigate and deal with it, right? That's a, when you, that's a great point, yes. Um, and so something you said <laughs> um, at the start of uh, just a few moments ago about how we feel when we start down the path of difficult conversations, conversations in general, but the difficult conversations. So um, let's be very honest here, right? Yes. <laughs> there are people, <laughs> I know them, you know them. <laughs> there are people who are quite comfortable being uncomfortable. Right. Um, as in, they are perfectly fine leaving that difficult conversation <laughs> untouched. They are like, I, I know I need to have it. I see it. It's in front of me. Not going to have it. Um, and I'll even say from my own personal experience, when I know that I need to embrace a challenging conversation or have a hard talk with someone. I am feeling it right now. I might have a physical and emotional response, right? Um, that I have to sit with for a minute. And I do this for a living, but I have to sit with it for a minute. Um, you know, and then and then proceed. Um, not everyone's like me and, and will just sit with it in two. Forever. <laughs> yeah. Forever. I I deal with it. I'm trained to do this. Um, but a lot of people just sit with it and be perfectly fine. Okay. So, so what do you say to those people? What do you, what do you say to people who are like, you know, I'm not going to risk comfort and in a lot of cases, peace, mm -hmm. depending on the dynamic, right? <clears throat> yeah. In my daily life, it's not worth it for me to have this conversation? What do you say to that? It's a great question. Um, one of the reasons I wrote this book from a personal brand standpoint is that I believe we have to be authentic. Mm -hmm. And because this book is about the relationships with people who are close to us, right? It's not about strangers on social media where you get into a, a Facebook fight over something. This is about people you care about and 
if I think about showing up authentically being yourself, the reason you have these conversations is so you can be more authentic and share um, what you're thinking about, right? Mm -hmm. And what matters. Now, some people go into a conversation and it's a monologue. That's not a conversation, that's a monologue. Mm -hmm. I think when you decide to go into these conversations, it really has to be a dialogue. Mm -hmm. And you know, if I think about conversations with, um, I won't give a lot of examples, but I'll say with my father. You know, I might say, well, you need to do this. And nobody likes to be told that. And so I might approach it instead by saying, gosh, I really care about you. And I'm worried about X, Y, Z. Can we talk about it? And so the important thing about difficult conversations is to remember that we want to create a safe space. And if you go into a conversation where it's already feeling confrontational or you haven't practiced saying some of those things to keep it safe, then I would say practice that. Because some of these conversations are really important and the, the risk of not having them way outweighs, right? The, the benefit of that relationship evolving through discussion. Right. There's really great research that shows, um, and it's in, it's in the book and I'll put you know, the, the research in the chat later, but it talks about when they monitor conversations and people are engaging, that's when your brain evolves and develops the most because we are born to be connected, right? We're, we're born to be in relationship and talking and discussing. That's when you grow. It's not when you're by yourself. <clears throat> and so these hard conversations can make for much better, deeper relationships where you can be yourself. There are some conversations like if you're coming out, that is all about who you are. And it's a really important conversation to have. And if you don't have it, you can't be your authentic self. There are other conversations about politics where, you know, if I think about Thanksgiving, do you want to have a peaceful Thanksgiving? Sure. Um, but you can also have that conversation. I should say, and you can have that conversation and just set some guardrails, right? It's okay to say, I'm not here to change your mind. I have an observation and I just want to get your perspective and just listen. That goes back to the framework. Just listen. Because a lot of times we need more information to understand someone else's perspective before you can really move forward anyways. So for me, having these difficult conversations was about being yourself and not carrying this monkey on your back of like, well, can't have this conversation and avoiding it because that adds a lot of stress. It's sitting out there, not being had, mm -hmm. where things could be a lot more positive if you just have it. And sometimes, and I know, I know you've seen this too, people make assumptions about what other people are thinking, why they said something, they have their own story going on in their head. And a lot of times the stories are a lot worse than the actual conversation. Mm -hmm. um, that's not always the case, but for the most part, you know, I remember sitting down with someone and saying, well, this is how you made me feel. Why did you say that? And they're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that bothered you. I totally didn't mean to do that. But it was stressing me out thinking about, well, why did they say that? Did they blah, 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 blah. And we have this whole story in our head. So I think it's important, one, to just be yourself in a thoughtful, intentional way. Um, and two, it just deepens the relationship uh, for sure. And it's expensive to not have these conversations, right, in a business setting. Oh, absolutely. the data around that's crazy where people yeah. avoid conversations on average, they're avoiding like two or three conversations for months at a time. Imagine how much stuff isn't getting done because you don't have a good working relationship. Right. So those are just some thoughts as to why, why it's important to have these because it's not productive uh, to avoid them. And I think it's important to note that even in the example that you gave, with your father, like how you would enter into that conversation. Hi, I care about you. I love, you know, I, what that is, those few words, that's connection, right? And so this idea of um, thinking about every conversation, difficult or not, but every conversation as being an opportunity to connect first and then get into whatever <laughs> that the topic may be. Um, I think is, is, is useful. I, 
I got to tell you, I don't know of any, and I've had many, <laughs> I don't know of any difficult conversation that has left me worse off than I was mm. before I had the conversation, right? Now, and I chose those words carefully. I didn't say I felt better, <laughs> right? I didn't, like, right. maybe yeah. I, maybe it was a really tough um, conversation, but I was better for it on the other um other side of it. And if I may just give a quick, um, very, very recent example of um, try connecting first. I, and the narratives that we play in our head, I um, thought I had completely flubbed um, something that's very important um, uh, that was going on in, uh, with one of my closest friends. And uh, it got me to my core. And I had not heard from this person in days. And so I'm sitting on the other end of a phone, okay, thinking the wildest thoughts about where this palace person now feels about me. Um, they're ignoring me. They want nothing more to do with me. Um, I had not talked to this. This person has said not one thing to me. <laughs> These are all things that I was telling myself. But it was important that I you know, find a way into to this conversation. I literally sent a text that said, hey, thinking about you. It sent. I was like, oh. <laughs> and um, <laughs> in, I don't know, give it, you know, a few minutes, maybe, maybe an hour or so, I get a response back. Hey, exclamation point. OMG, we totally need to connect so much to catch up. It was as, <laughs> totally opposite of all the things that I had running in my head. I was literally sitting with this pit in my stomach for no reason. <laughs> okay. Um, you have and very good imagination. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's wild. Okay. So, but I, um, I started with the point. I didn't, I didn't, the first time I didn't say, Hey, uh, so yeah, about a thing I just did, 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 you know, that's not how I started. <laughs> that's not how I chose to start it. I said, let me try to, or, you know, my thought process was, let me try to connect. So simple. Hi, thinking about you. So I didn't even, it wasn't, hi, hi. I didn't even ask a question. Are you mad at me? <laughs> a question. Yeah. Cause I, was, I didn't want to give, you know, I just, I put it out there. You know, and then did this, but um, but that that allowed for a response that completely, you know, um, like I said, sort of was in the, the opposite end of, of where my head was. But and so, what's going to happen now is it was oh, we need to find a time to connect. So we'll eventually connect, and I will then say, you know, hey, listen, you know, I completely flubbed that you know, and get into it, what have you, but at least I know I'm coming, at least I know, I know where they are. They know where I am with it. Right. Okay. And we can have an effective conversation. So, um, connection, I think, um, is, um, as, as you've highlighted, um, I think it's very important with any conversation, especially the difficult ones. So, well, I think building that rapport in the beginning, just checking yeah. in, checking seeing in. how they're doing, being fully present, is really important. I also think ahead of time, prepare, mm -hmm. right? If you're not sure how the conversation is going to go, map out a few different scenarios yeah. and think about what's the worst that could happen? Yeah. What's the best that could happen? What was my role in getting us to this point? Because it's important to self-reflect and think about mm -hmm. what did I do or not do that might be creating tension? Mm -hmm just so you're ready, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I think preparing ahead of time, I will jot down bullets, you know, especially if it's a business conversation, mm -hmm. because I wanna make sure I don't forget something, mm -hmm. um, especially if it's a difficult conversation. Mm -hmm. And that planning ahead of time can mean when you get to the meeting that you're not stressed, right? right? If I'm um, frustrated with someone, I'll have that conversation out loud by myself to get it out of my system. Like, why did they do that? But that way, when I go to meet with them or talk, um, I've already said those things and I'm in a different spot for that conversation. 
So I think it's really important to scenario plan um, ahead of time. Mm -hmm. The number one thing that has worked for me is I practice difficult conversations every day, whether it's getting my kids to do homework or whatever it is, right? We all have a, a spectrum of conversations. Mm -hmm. um, take a deep breath, right? Mm -hmm. Breathing will disrupt that sort of fight or flight survival mode. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's important, that's for yourself. The other thing is ask a question to the person you're speaking with. Be fully present. Genuinely ask a, a, uh, a question. And it could be something like, you know, I, I understand how that could have really made you frustrated. Tell me more. What can I do to help move us forward? Sometimes you need to ask a question because you need to give yourself more time to breathe because <laughs> you're still stressed. Mm -hmm. But asking a question can also help disrupt their brain, so to speak, mm -hmm. and help them de-escalate, right? And, and take a deep breath as well. Because if someone comes to you, let's say something terrible happens, they're sobbing, they're upset, you're not sure what's going on, asking a question like, I really want to understand what you're saying. It really matters to me. Can you like take a little bit of a deep breath and tell me a little bit more slowly because I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. That question can help them get their brain to a higher level of processing and not really be hijacked into a fight or flight. Mm -hmm. And so those two little things have made a huge difference mm -hmm. um, in any conversation. And they sound small. But, you know, when you're talking with someone about politics or, or whatever it is, remembering that they are not trying to hurt you. They're not the tiger in the jungle, right? Like we can take a deep breath and really just be present and listen. Mm -hmm. If we can't do anything else, or if they're saying something about politics or whatnot, and we really don't know what to say, just take a deep breath and ask questions. Yeah. That can be a beautiful conversation where you just listen and learn. Right. That can be a successful conversation. I mean, for you, because you work a lot with executives and, and brands, big companies, mm -hmm. what are some of the things you've seen that, you know, as you've coached individuals, that really helps as they're preparing for difficult conversations? What do you, what do you offer as advice? Because I know you do this a lot. Yeah, I've, um, I've done it quite a bit. And um, I will, um, I think, you know, forever remember uh, summer of 2020 as being um, at a particularly important time um, in my in my private practice and that was um, again in this in the weeks um, after the murder of George Floyd and um, uh, the murder of Breonna Taylor and the protests that were um, erupting all over the country and you suddenly saw statements being issued by companies and executives. Um, I coached a bit during that time and, 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 and the one thing that I found myself leading with in those um, efforts is, as I mentioned before, connection, hmm. right? Um, how how are you going to get through to an individual who could have been impacted in, on any um, uh, in any given way um, by the events that, that are unfolding? And and what was interesting about um, that that work is that the stakes were so high for some of these efforts. They are, we're talking about the senior most um, levels of an organization where shareholders are watching, boards of directors are interested in what you're going to say. You have to worry about how consumers and customers are going to react to whatever it is you say. Um, and I started with, as we're talking about here with, well, saying nothing is not an option, right? Um, so again, let's look for the ways to connect. Um, and so I, 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 I like to start there. Um, um, and then, you know, it really depends on, 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 the, on the context. I look for ways to leave both parties whole. Um, and so, and I, and I share this in, in my um, work a lot with my clients is look for the connection, 
get into the crux of the of the conversation, like handle the business that needs to be handled. Like, what are you trying to say? What are we trying to accomplish? You know, whether it's a company wide memo or a very important. I once um, <laughs> I was once behind the scenes of a communication to um, to the White House. <laughs> um, so it's you know all the you know that that end of the spectrum as well and so um you know so let's deal with what we're trying trying to get across and then how do we exit this this conversation this piece of communication with you feeling whole the person on the other end feeling whole we've accomplished something in the middle of, of that um and then we on the back end we're teeing up what's next do you want a phone call do you want what you know we call it cta call to action mm -hmm. uh business and marketing world, but, you know, what's your, what's your call to action? You know, what's your next step? Um, and then making sure that we follow through on that. So it's a very simple uh, sort of way that I um, have, you know, been working with um, organizations and, and executives on, like I said, on everything from company-wide memos to <laughs> email correspondences to, you know, you know, I work with them on what are we going to say in this op-ed. Um, and so, um, so yes, it's a very, uh, kind of simplistic way that I that I approach it. And it, it it's not cookie cutter. Like it's not the same for every single individual, but in broad strokes, that's what it is. So. Well, I think for, um, um, there's a little, there's bit, of a little bit of an echo. Um, um, for conversations where the, I mean, every conversation, the audience is the most important like crux of the, the conversation. Where is your audience at? What do they believe? What do they know? What information are they bringing to the dialogue? Um, because as you said, there are a lot of conversations where, you know, from a senior executive standpoint, their information, their experiences, their background, informs what they say, and it might be very different than what their audience has experienced, mm -hmm. what their audience is going through. And so um, even if it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation or one-to-many or whatever that is, really understanding and speaking to the audience in words that resonate with them, mm -hmm. right? And not just what you would say, but finding that common ground, finding the common language um, is really important. I mean, even you know, for the chapters that I wrote on, on race and on diversity, you know, I went out and, and interviewed people who they don't look like me, right? I don't have authority to speak about race. And so, I mean, I can speak about what I need to learn about it. I can speak about what it's like in my, you know, growing up in Augusta, growing up here, but I need to go ask people who have gone through it. I mean, a good friend of mine who I interviewed <clears throat> was sharing how, and he's African-American, veteran, you know, he went to the Capitol building one day with his friend, middle of broad daylight, got out of the car, took a picture of the Capitol building, and Capitol Police come up, guns drawn, asking him, what are you doing? And his license plate says, retired veteran, really good. <laughs> and, and so when he shared that experience with me, that just gives you a whole different perspective on this is what it's like, right? And it was important, George Floyd was, a. there are a lot of moments that have been pivotal this year. The reason that mattered is because we had video. People could see it, hear it, feel it, get as close as possible to it without being there per se. Mm -hmm. And so that opened up a whole dialogue and opened, I think, people's eyes to, this is real, this happens every day we need to have a conversation about it mm -hmm. and yeah. get comfortable having a conversation and learning together mm -hmm. um, because we are all in the same boat. Mm -hmm. um, some people might be rowing in different directions. That's a different conversation, mm -hmm. but if we can't talk about it, even if it's uncomfortable, especially if it's uncomfortable, that's when we develop, right? We think about coal. The only way coal goes to a diamond is through tension and under pressure. The reason we have these conversations to grow and learn is because they're hard. Now, what I would recommend is like start with a small conversation with someone you know, like and trust who knows you and practice that way. Don't dive into one of these conversations with someone you don't know. 
right? Practice it in a safe way, which is what I loved about our high school reunion conversation um, was that it was, all of us were kind of dipping our toe in the water and, and listening and talking and sharing. Mm -hmm. And it was a listening and sharing conversation, yeah. right? I'm not even sure we got to collaboration because we weren't there yet. We really were just listening and yeah. sharing. Yeah. Um, and that in itself was really powerful so that we don't feel like we're alone. Right. Right. Um, that's why when when people go through situations that are hard, losing a parent, et cetera, mm -hmm. sharing that, even though it's hard, mm -hmm. it actually helps to share. And it helps to hear and have it shared with you. And there are so many people I spoke to where just talking about it made it less stressful. Mm -hmm. Even when you're laughing about, oh, that's the conversation I had with this person or that person. And, and you all can sort of laugh through it mm -hmm. and get through it together. That's a, that's a big deal. How do you think about vulnerability in difficult conversations? Um, this is something that Brene Brown talks about a lot in her work. Um, where does that play when we're thinking about um, a difficult conversation? This, 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 um, this feeling of um, vulnerability when we're when we need Everywhere. to everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge Brene Brown fan, um, and I think a lot of this is vulnerability. And for me, vulnerability is not weakness; it's it's courage to speak up. And I tell my clients, telepathy is not a strategy. <laughs> the same is true in conversations. I love that. <laughs> if you are thinking or feeling something, then it's important to share that, yeah. right? If somebody says something that offended you, it's okay to say, gosh, we're really good friends. And I know you would not try to hurt me in a million years. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to talk to you or and I wanted to talk to you about this conversation last week, this is what you said, and this is how it made me feel. I know that's not what you meant. And I wanted just to bring it to your attention because I value our relationship, right? The reason I'm talking with you is because I care about you and I want this relationship to work and be successful. It's important to let people know you care about them and that's why you wanna have the conversation. Mm -hmm. It's not because you're trying to punish them or you don't like them. It's because you care that you're opening up and sharing them. Right, right, right. And I think that's that's huge. Right. So before we uh, open it up for Q&A, one last question for yeah. you, Jen, which is, um, so this is not your first foray into publishing. Um, you wrote a book um, before this one um, around personal branding. Now we've got this wonderful uh, book. What's next? What's next for you? What's next for your work? Where? What more can we expect from, from you? Oh, what more can we expect? Um, I heard somebody ask me about the third book today and I was like, it's in my brain, but I'm not too soon, too soon. Not ready for that yet. Um, I do want to continue to bring up this idea of difficult conversations in relation to being authentic, personal brand. How do these show up in the workplace? You know, we're coming into the new year. Um, as people are thinking about 2021, how are they going about um, embracing some of these difficult conversations and practicing them? Maybe when we're a little further away from the election, a little further away from the holidays, um, how are they thinking about you know, asking for a raise? How are they thinking about if they are coming out, right? How do they plan that conversation in advance to increase the odds of their success? And so, you know, again, I'm not the expert, um, however, I would love to share, uh, you know, share more of this framework, just help people feel comfortable practicing because it, it's the, it's the practicing. It's a muscle that has to be built. I am not going to run a marathon tomorrow. I mean, I wouldn't two years from now, but even if I were going to start, you just start by walking and then slowly getting there. So, you know, start with a, a simple conversation, maybe with your spouse about, doing the dishes instead of passive aggressively saying, Hey, when's the last time we did the laundry or the dishes? Like just say, gosh, I really have to help the kids. Could you, you know, do the dishes? Let's divide and conquer. Right. And, and I'm not talking about my husband, by the way, he's, he's <laughs> no, we, we've had those conversations. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you know, just start practicing. Mm -hmm. 
Wonderful. So I, I know we have some questions from the audience, so I would love to uh, to tackle some of those as well. And so, you know, as we wait for some of the questions to pop up, um, you know, the, the book is available. It is on Amazon. Um, this week, the ebook is only 99 cents. So it's a, a holiday special. Yes. I still like having the physical book. Um, and I so, do. Oh. Yes, I, I mean, yeah, I need I have, to feel it. Yeah. Some people might say I have a problem buying paperback books. Or no, no, not at all. I'm with you there. Mm -hmm. So what's the best way to talk about hard questions with coworkers? That is a broad question. So it depends on the situation. Danielle, what do you think? Where, where would you start? And I'll chime in. So first thing that came to mind was what's the relationship with the coworker? So I think the answer to that depends on that dynamic. Um, yet and still, um, I always say, I always believe, I don't, you know, people have their work wives and their work husbands and these people they're really close with. I maybe have learned the hard way of no matter how close you think you are to a coworker, just, you know, um, be cautious um, in, in, in those, you know, conversations and think them, them all the way through. I think, um, again, just think all the way around the dynamic. What's your relationship with the coworker? What is the conversation that you want to have? What are the implications of the conversation? Should you be having this conversation with the coworker first? Is this conversation something that you should probably have approached with someone else? I don't know if it's a supervisor or some HR, mm -hmm. you know, some, mm -hmm. Lots of things to think about mm -hmm. when about conversations um, with coworkers. I would say if you are unsure, um, HR is always a good place to start or to consult. Um, if you do want to, um, if there's someone in HR that can help you navigate, um, nav navigate that. But if it's someone that you feel, you know, okay, I know this person. You know, we're, we're friends. We're cool. Um, uh, I can, and I need to have this conversation with them, um, then, you know, do for it, you know, go for it um, and, and leveraging all the tools that we've shared here. Just, I would just caution <laughs> um, you know, emotions. So emotions at bay, um, you know, whatever the topic is, again, don't, that's a, that's a realm where I would say, don't try to go at that alone. Um, if you think there is any doubt or if there is any doubt that it could negatively impact your employment. Well, and I think another, normally I would say if we were in a physical working environment, I would say think about location, right? Where are you having the conversation? Is it in a neutral place? Um, you know, now being virtual and online for a lot of folks, the conversations we would have by the water cooler or informally, we have to opt in to have those scheduled, right? So I think for difficult conversations, really thinking about how do you, um, when are you scheduling the meeting, right? Are you scheduling it on a Friday so they can sort of think about it over the weekend? Do you need to have it on a Monday morning? Um, what's the downside? Again, do the scenario planning. I would practice with someone, practice with someone and have them, you know, almost act it out and say, what if it does go off the hook and, and it sort of goes off track? What do they say? And how do you respond? How do you deescalate? I think it's very important to know when to press pause and say, gosh, things seem to be escalating. Let's press pause. Let's take a deep breath. I value your relationship. I want to make sure that we don't leave this meeting not being able to work together because it's too important. Mm -hmm. So I think having those um, talking points ready mm -hmm. and making sure you can stay in control of your emotions is important. I think it's really important too to think about what's your goal. So what does success look like? Um, and what questions do you need to ask first to get more information so you understand what's really happening and not go off of assumptions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's important you might ask things like, you know, once you check in with them, how are you doing? How are things going? 
this happened the other day. This is how I perceived it. However, I really want to get your perspective because maybe it was totally different for you, right? Yeah. What was your perspective? Mm -hmm. What could I have done differently, et cetera? So I would, I would game play it out um, and role play and see what that looks like. Work conversations are tricky because, again, telepathy is not a strategy. You don't know what someone else is going through. They could have said something, done something that honestly has nothing to do with you. Absolutely. Maybe they're stressed at home. They've got other stuff going on. That's highly likely, especially in this environment. So how do you, again, make sure they feel safe, help yes. them, and also be open-minded that what it, what might you have done to contribute? Right. And, you know, how can you... Um, how can you step up and share that? Right. I think it's important to remember to like with any conversation, it's like conversation. There are more than one party. Right. So um, to keep that in mind um, as you're approaching the conversation, um, as you said, what's their point of view? What's their take on what, you know, and, and so and to go into the conversation with that being a goal is to listen. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, the goal should be to listen to get their perspective, not just I want to talk to you about X, right? No. Absolutely. So we have another question from Tony. How do you address someone in a supervisory role that's not open to conversations with staff? So if this is someone that you report into and they don't want to talk with staff, I would think about who do they trust? Who is an influential person for them? And how do you um, engage potentially another person to help influence that? I think there's another piece. If you have a trusting relationship with your supervisor, I always try to reframe a negative. So if you were meeting with your supervisor, instead of saying something like, hey, we never really hear from you, it'd be good to hear from you. Another way to think about it is our team really looks you know, they really value when you share insights. Here's one of the things I, I think that folks are looking for. What are your thoughts on when we should talk about it as a team? Right, empower the person in the conversation to come up with their own answer. Because if it's their idea, the likelihood of them doing it is much greater. If you tell someone you need to have a conversation with the team, I mean, if you have that kind of relationship with your supervisor and you can be that direct, maybe do that but i always try to approach it from um a question that you can ask hey what do you think you know what makes sense from a communication standpoint as we plan for 2021 right uh how often do you think we should meet um but empower the person you're speaking with to come up with their own answer and it's okay if there are leading questions um, but i think it's important People will make their behaviors, they will change their behaviors if you plant a little seed, but they need to be the ones to make that that grow and that happen. Does that resonate, Danielle? Like, what would you say? I, I, I have nothing else to add. <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. I'm sitting here nodding away. Uh, absolutely. I agree 100%. Yeah, I would ask lots of questions. Uh, with COVID, having difficult conversations about preparing for family members affairs has been hard virtually. How should family members work through this? Um, and I, I think for, so I don't know in what context, but I'll start from the, the easier to the less easy. Um, I was just actually talking to my, my cousin via email this morning about, you know, my cousins and who live all across the country, we haven't seen each other uh, actually since my mom passed. It's been over a year. And I was like, well, let's just set a time and get together and chat on Zoom um, and connect and maybe, you know, talk about the book, play some games, whatever, but just catch up. So I think there's the informal where, again, because we're virtual, we have to make it a formal action where we get together and we proactively think about it. I think when it's family affairs, like maybe someone passes, maybe you're talking about estate planning, maybe you're talking about a wedding, maybe someone's introducing a new family member. Um, there's a really great book called The Art of Gathering. Um, and it's, it's extremely helpful because instead of saying, let's just have a get together in a meeting, Pray Parker is the author. She's very clear about 
what's the purpose of the get together? And how do we build an experience that brings people together in a thoughtful, intentional way? And so for family members and affairs, that might be a phone call conversation you have in advance or Zoom where you, again, you bring up, I really care about you. This is what's happening. I wanna make sure that we stay together as a family. How can we best do that, right? Again, ask people for their input and what they think, how they might approach it. Um, it's like the meetings in the business world. I know, Daniel, you've seen this. It's like the meetings leading up to the meeting, right? You meet with people to get buy-in and then you have the actual meeting where you need the actual buy-in. Um, what are your thoughts on family? family affairs? Um, this is one of the, the way, the, the areas where I say, um, you know, connections, you know, important. Um, and so um, finding a way to have these very important conversations um, while, again, leaving all parties whole. Um, I think that should be or should be considered as a goal. Um, it is one sadly one of the facts of human nature and life but that when families do begin to plan for affairs of loved ones that's when so, so much gets lost and um, relationships get strained and um and i've just always thought that um it is it is not i used to just think it was my family but as i got older i realized man this is just human we all have dysfunctional families i mean perfectly imperfect family. Um, and i think it's just a testament to the impact of a loved one on the family right yeah that the impact are high that the tensions are you know so um Oh my gosh, I just feel like if if you um, can have the tough conversations the way we've laid them out, but if you can somehow figure out a way to bring it back together um, and leave everyone whole, um, and that may take time. I'm a big fan of space and giving space for you and for others. Um, not everything has to be hashed out and done right here in this moment, in this time. Yeah. I, I, let, let space and time uh, work in your favor. Um, yes. And just, you know, find a way to bring it all back. That's such a great point. I mean, a lot of times, and this is why I wrote the book the way I did too, a lot of conversations are, they should not happen in one conversation. Right? Like pick a very small thing that if we can figure this out and it's the least controversial, start there, right? Get a quick win, practice the collaboration. Then set up another time for another thing. Like it's okay to plan these out. You don't yeah. have to get everything solved in one meeting. And if right. it feels like it's going off the rails, just say, gosh, it feels like, you know, yeah, that we need a little bit of time. Yeah, Let's just take a deep breath. And let's yeah. talk again more, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And the other one, and you brought this up earlier, but I really want to point it out extremely explicitly. Do not be the messenger, mm. right? We all know what happens to the messenger. The messenger gets shot. <laughs> if someone comes to you, whether it's a work you know, conversation or a home conversation, and they say, gosh, you know Danielle really well. Could you just like coach her on um how to dress more appropriately or could you talk to her about how she writes her emails no absolutely not right yeah. that's a messenger conversation yeah. yeah that person needs to have that conversation with someone directly and, and i know you dress beautifully so i wasn't going to pick on you but just as an example right um don't be the messenger right figure out how, how to either make it a conversation but ideally the person who came to you needs to go have that conversation mm -hmm. courage you need someone to help like you can practice with them but they need to have that conversation because the messenger gets shot do not be the messenger that's no fun right that's a monologue it's not a dialogue you are on a mission that will not be fun i get um, asked all the time can oh you? yes just because you're good at communicating, okay, not when you're the sucker who is like, oh, I'll help. Do you always want to help? No, no. no oh my gosh, no. I really appreciate that you came to me and wanted to help. However, 
<laughs> I really think you can do this, right? Here are some ideas. Um, I've said that before. I've actually yeah. said, you can do this. You know, I'll say, so here's some talking about, but you can do this. You can do this. <laughs> well, I know we're, we're right at um, just at seven o'clock. And so I just want to say thank you to our viewers who, who came out and spent this time with us. Thank you, Danielle. I'm so glad we've talked twice in one year and I've talked even more. Um, my year, for sure. <laughs> North Western is very fortunate to have you. Um, very glad you were able to join. Uh, again, you know, you can grab your copy uh, of my book on Amazon. I would love for suggestions, feedback, if you want to practice difficult conversations, uh, just connect with me on LinkedIn, drop me a note. Uh, again, the ebook is on sale this week for 99 cents just for this week. And the print book is $18.99. It'd be a great stocking stuffer. It has a very friendly cover with the ostrich, right? Very friendly cover. Uh, he's going to be our mascot, I think, because <laughs> we're all avoiding some conversation. But you so can good. do it, right? We can, we can take our head out of the sand and just pick one conversation you know you want to have that's easier, but you're still avoiding it and, and practice there. Uh, but it's been great speaking with you. Again, thank you to everybody who tuned in. Uh, tomorrow I'll be talking with Jen Molino and she'll be sharing with me ideas for women in leadership roles. What are ways they can ask difficult questions and start difficult conversations as they move up in their career. Um, and then next week I'll be speaking with John Saunders and Daphne Jefferson Tuesday evening, the same time, six to seven about what the heck it's like to be an author, um, yeah. because they both were authors in this cohort with me. Um, and it's a journey, let me tell you, lots of great stuff to share there. And next Wednesday, we'll be talking with Diane Falk over lunch about the difficult conversations leaders are having to have now in this environment, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them are positive, some of them are challenging, but it's all about how do you navigate those conversations and what does that look like if you're in a leadership? So thank you again, Danielle. You're Wonderful so seeing you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody. And we will see you uh, tomorrow from 12 to 1 for our next author series interview.